Aloha mai kako. My name is Ku'u Hiapu Jiang. And my name is Deva Escobar. And happy Valentine's Day and welcome to Vai Lao. Thank you so much for coming in and hanging out with us today on Valentine's Day. We hope you all are having a spectacular Valentine's Day. To my co-host right next to me, Deva, how are you doing today? Well, I'm doing fabulous, Hiapo, but they don't want to hear about me. They want to hear about Vai Lao. What is Vai Lao? Great question, Hiapo. Well, Vai Lao is a series of themed storytelling events that aim to connect our UH Hilo Ohana with the community at large. With all the disconnection that many of us are facing due to the pandemic, Vai Lao hopes to create a sense of togetherness through the vulnerability of storytelling. But you're probably wondering, what does Vai Lao mean? Right, so Vai Lao means the gathering of different fresh waters towards a larger body of water. Likewise, is it here in Wailao, where we are inviting different people from around the community to come together, to share their stories, and to hopefully connect to this bigger theme that we're trying to get to today, which is the importance of love. Wow, that was purely poetry. With those words, you surely have a special someone for Valentine's Day? Yeah, about that, I don't actually, sadly, but you know what, let's just start with our event today, shall we, Deva? Okay, okay. <laughs> so, you know who won't avoid my questions about love? Of course. We know him. We love him. Dr. G. Dr. Ron Gordon is our topic expert for today, bringing us our theme, the importance of communication in love. Dr. Ron Gordon, who has a PhD from the University of Kansas, is a professor of communications at UH Hilo, and he also teaches interpersonal communication seminar in human dialogue, seminar in listening, and communication and love. He has previously served as chair of the Department of Communication at UH Hilo, president of the Pacific and Asian Communication Association, and recently authored the book, The Way of Dialogue, One Plus One Equals Three. Thank you. Communication, among other things, is the life process by which we create and sustain and repair and transform human relationships. Communication is the way we come together and the way we create common meaning. And when love is involved, communication is the way we come into greater unity, greater wholeness, greater oneness, to communicate, to create oneness. And that's what this collection of Wailao stories are all about. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. So here we go. Here's our first story, entitled For the Love of Gran by Lee Dombrowski. Lee Dombrowski is the Performing Arts Center Manager at the University of Hawaii at Hilo and is passionate about the performing arts. Professionally, she has been a producer, production manager, costume ma um, designer, wig master, makeup artist, sculptor, costume director, costume shop manager, wardrobe mistress, and a dresser. As an amateur, she has tried everything from dance to carpentry. Lee has a BFA in theater from the University of Colorado, Boulder, and an MFA from California Institute of the Arts. She loves a good story. Take it away, Lee. My grandma was deaf. Now, she wasn't born deaf. She woke up deaf one morning in her early 50s. And because she wasn't born deaf, she didn't use sign language. She read lips and relied on written explanations when necessary. None of us grandkids ever knew Granny as a hearing person. So for us, it was just totally natural. Granny often talked just a little bit or maybe a lot too loud. She'd sometimes say, am I talking too loud? And we'd uh, yeah, you are. We were usually in a public place when she thought or chose to ask, so it could be a little awkward. Now, Grandma was from Kentucky, and her southern charm and manners were impeccable, and her accent was thick. In fact, people said it became more prominent when she went deaf. Sometimes it was so thick it gave you pause. What did she just say? I said, pace the half and half. Pass the half and half. 
Now, my grandma and grandpa lived with my auntie in their later years, and I used to spend summers with them, my five cousins, my auntie, my uncle, grandma, grandpa, and I'd visit a lot when I was in college. My grandpa was almost 15 years older than my grandma, and the story went that grandpa used to date granny's oldest sister. And when Gran was five, she was the youngest of 14, Grandpa would come and she would make him promise to marry her before she would let him take her sister out on a date. Well, fast forward 15 years and they were married. Grandpa was a little bit cantankerous in his old age. He would yell at anything that moved. Kids, dogs, cats, rabbits, it moved, he yelled. Rumor has it that that was the source of Granny's deafness. She just got tired of listening to him yell. All of the grandkids are spaced almost exactly 18 months apart. One boy and five girls. And we girls were particularly close to our grandma. I'm not really sure how it even came about anymore, but we used to call her Granny Frog. Being the only child of Granny's only son, Gran and I had a particular bond, and I wasn't around as much as the other grandkids. She used to tell me that I had the best lips, and she would call for me when she couldn't hear someone. Granny's lip reading led to some pretty funny situations. There was one point where she got it into her head that my dad had a pet pig. Why does he have a pet pig? I don't understand. Why does he have a pet pig? <laughs> we decided that that was sort of the quintessential Gran. And now we randomly will say to one another years later, why does he have a pet pig? Granny also had her own notion of what hearing meant. If she had her back to you, she couldn't hear you. Therefore, if you had your back to her, you couldn't hear her. I'll never forget my cousin's three-year-old son Grandma's standing at the kitchen sink and he's standing directly behind her, screaming at the top of his lungs, Great! I am talking to you! After about the third or fourth ear-splitting yell, Gran turned around to see this red-faced child standing behind her and she very calmly said to him, Oh, hi, Jack. I didn't hear you come in. <laughs> We all relied on Granny for advice in matters of the heart, knowing that she was an excellent judge of character and she'd always give it to us straight. So when I first met my husband, I took him home to meet my Granny Frog. Now, Mike is a very calm, quiet, gentle, but tall man. And my grandma was probably about four foot nine at this point. Mike was fixing dinner with his back to the room, and Gran, in typical fashion, says to me, a little bit too loudly, he's so tall, how'd he get to be that way? Do you like him like that? And I could see Mike sort of shaking. He was clearly laughing to himself. And Gran took my hands and I just smiled and said, I think he drank his milk. And yes, I like him like that. The three of us enjoyed a quiet dinner together, which was a rare occasion in my auntie's circus of a house. Talking story, telling jokes, laughing. At the end of the evening, Mike received the ultimate seal of approval, a hug from Gran. It's often the unspoken, yet clearly heard, ways in which we communicate our love for one another that matters the most. That was truly beautiful. Family really is everything. I agree, I agree. The ultimate seal of approval, given not through words, but a sincere hug from Granny 
the power of nonverbal communication to send messages of love clearly, strongly, straight to the heart. Sometimes the shortest distance between two points is an eloquent hug. Granny knew this. Granny was an authentic and efficient communicator. Thanks, Granny, and thank you, Lee. Our next story is called The Electric Guitar. Randy Hirakawa is a local boy, born and raised on the island of Kauai. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Hawaii at Manoa and his master's and PhD degrees from the University of Washington. Randy is nationally and internationally known for his expertise in small group communication and group decision making. He has published three books and over 60 research papers, delivered numerous national and international lectures, including prestigious ones at Northwestern University, the University of Washington, and the University of Utah. In 2006, he was inducted into the University of Washington Alumni Hall of Fame for his academic and professional accomplishments. Randy served as the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Hawaii at Hilo from 2005 to 2016. Prior to returning home to Hawaii, he served on the faculty at the Pennsylvania State University and the University of Iowa. In his spare time, Randy enjoys fishing, playing softball, and rocking the electric bass. An important core value in Japanese culture is a concept called kodomo no tamini, which translates into for the sake of the children. Growing up, I saw numerous examples of my parents and my grandparents displaying the principle of kodomo no tamini in the way they raised us. This story I want to tell you is an example of the practice of kodomo no tamini in a typical Japanese family growing up. So I grew up in the age of the Beatles, and we were all Beatle fans, crazy Beatle fans. We wore Beatle boots, we wore Beatle clothes, we even had Beatle haircuts. And I remember us cutting out paper guitars and pasting it to broomsticks to pretend that we were the Beatles playing to their music. And of course, many of us wanted to have our own real electric guitar so that we could form our own band and be like the Beatles. But electric guitars in my day were very expensive. And so I never thought of asking my parents for an electric guitar. Now, as it turns out, there was a music store in my little town that we passed every day when we went to and from school. And in the display window of this music store was a beautiful guitar. It was, the, it was the same guitar that John Lennon played. And it was a very expensive guitar. So we would all admire the guitar and wish that someday we could afford to have a guitar like that. One day I come home from school and in the living room is this very same electric guitar. Wasn't Christmas, wasn't my birthday, wasn't any special occasion. So I was confused. So when my parents came home, I asked my parents, what was the guitar there for? And my dad said, it's yours. So he said, it's yours. Years later, I learned that my dad used to save a few dollars from his paycheck every month and put into a sock. And it was, he used that money to buy that electric guitar for me. For no reason other than kodomo no tamini, for the sake of the children. And I kept that guitar for many years, even after it was broken, to remind me of the sacrifice that my dad and my parents made for us growing up so that we could have a better life and we could have more things than they had growing up. You know, my dad has long passed. I still play music. In fact, I'm in a band and every night I practice. And in my practice room, there's a photo of my dad and he's smiling. And I know that he's smiling because he knows that the sacrifice he made was worth it. Wow, 
Mahalo Nui Lo Randy for sharing your story. I really do agree and, and that really hits home honestly. The, the little things in life that really connects you to the, your loved ones, especially those who have passed on. Truly. Thank you so much for sharing your story. A guitar, an amplifier, and a plain spoken dad communicating his love. And to this day, dad sitting in a photo on the dresser communicating his love. Message sent, message received, message understood, circle of communication complete, right to the heart. Beautiful love story, Randy. Thanks so much. Man, I love all of your stories. Now, speaking of love, our next story is entitled Speaking Love by Rebecca Choi. Rebecca Choi was born in South Korea, immigrated to the U.S. with her family when she was just seven years old and grew up in Southern California. After receiving her bachelor's in political economy from Princeton University, she worked in investment banking and private equity in New York and San Francisco, making investments around the world. Among other things, Rebecca has been a chief operating officer for a graduate university at Silicon Valley and a chief of staff for a national nonprofit that provides entrepreneurship training to people with criminal histories. Rebecca cares deeply about empowering people through education and economic opportunities, as well as celebrating diversity and strengthening connections in our community. She currently contributes as a volunteer for Keiki Heroes, a vibrant Hawaii, Next Tech STEM program, Hilo Missionary Church, WASC Senior College and University Commission and Princeton Alumni Schools Com Committees. Rebecca and her husband have three beautiful daughters, ages 12, 10, and four. Rebecca is an avid reader who enjoys feeding people and having dance parties with her girls. You know how full-grown, respectable adults say goo goo, gaga, and turn into little kids in front of infants? Well, I never really understood that. Why don't you just talk to them in your normal voice? They don't understand what you're saying anyway. Or so I thought until I had a baby of my own, my own baby Kay. Our first daughter came and without even me noticing, I was speaking in a high pitch sing songy, oh, you're the cutest thing ever and making all kinds of noises that I never knew I could make. Scientists call that infant directed speech and Studies after studies show that babies actually prefer it. They prefer this method of communication because they don't understand the words, but they can pick up on the intonation and the speed and the pitch and the emotional cues of infant directed speech. And it's really amazing how they react to it. Their whole face lights up and their eyes sparkle. And that of course just reinforces how we communicate with the baby. Well, infant directed speech is just a simple example of how important communication is in expressing and sharing our love. Communication isn't just about the words, although the right words can help. It's about being in tune with the person you're communicating with and connecting in a way that they feel can be understood and they can enjoy. Well, as our daughter grew from a little baby to a toddler, we started to use what they call toddlerese. They're simple short sentences like, eat food, sit down, let's go. And this is the best kind of communication for a toddler brain that is trying to make sense of the words and trying to understand them. And most of us mamas and papas do it naturally. We're not taught this or read it in books, although some of us do. We just get it. We know intuitively to speak in this very simple way to connect with our toddlers. But then as our children start growing older, it gets more complicated. And our baby Kay is no longer a baby. She's an adolescent and she's becoming a lovely young lady. She's bright and creative and adventurous and independent. And now I don't always know how to communicate with her well. 
how to be in tune with her in the way that she prefers it. Honestly, I fail so much. She would sometimes tell me a story and instead of just listening and validating her, I would correct her or point out other facts. In my intention, I was just trying to help, help her learn and help her grow. But to her, it felt like rejection and criticism. And then there'd be times I would see her visibly upset. And I'd ask, what's wrong, love? And she would reply curtly, nothing, I'm fine. Fine, that despicable four letter F word, I really have come to despise. I would inquire further just because I can tell she's not okay, but I found that for her, it felt obtrusive, even oppressive when I kept asking what's wrong. It is so much easier to go goo goo gaga and to talk in simple sentences with our little ones. But communicating well takes time and care and lots of practice. It's risky and it takes courage. And even with the best of intentions, we can fail. So instead of beating myself up or being super angry, I'm giving myself grace and to keep trying. I've leaned on simple things like writing a little silly note with a drawing of a kitty cat to just tell her, I love you. I'm not great at drawing and I don't personally like cats much, but I know Kay loves them. Or just sitting next to her while she's reading a book and not asking her questions, which is really hard for me. But I've come to realize that's how she feels loved, just being there together. I also ask her about the computer game she's playing. And when she explains, I don't understand much of it, but I listen and then I meow a little and give her a squeeze just to know that, just to let her know that I love her. And when I get it wrong, more often than I like, I apologize that I missed the mark. Through it all though, I hope that she will hear when my heart beats, I love you, baby K. And I may not always know how to communicate that well, but I will keep trying because your heart matters to me. I'll keep trying to find the different words and to communicate in the way that makes you comfortable and makes you feel loved until I see that sparkle in your eyes again. That was beautifully said. Sometimes all you can do is love people, and that's good enough. Mom wanting to see her kids' faces light up, their eyes sparkle, baby talk, no problem, toddlerese, no problem. But then comes adolescence, communication gaps, communication breakdowns. But with a little patience, a little time, some little notes, little drawings, mom sitting on the bed beside her daughter, talking, touching, hugging, communication achieved, faces lighting up, eyes sparkling, everybody smiling. Our next story is brought to you by Jasmine Zhao called Friends I No Longer Talk To. Jasmine Zhao was born on Molokai and raised on Maui. She transferred to UH Hilo in 2019 and is currently a senior majoring in Japanese and also pursuing a minor in history. She is the editor-in-chief of Ho Honu, UH Hilo's academic journal. In her free time, she likes to make crochet animals, read obnoxiously long history books, and attempt to bake without burning her apartment down. Same, Jasmine. <laughs> there is a pillow on a shelf. The pillow is covered in little images of yellow pineapple and decorated with tiny plastic jewels. It's a Christmas gift from a girl I knew since third grade. She gives it to me the year before I go to college. She knows I want to go far away one day and wants me to have a reminder of home. The pillow is uncomfortable. The tiny plastic jewels make the surface unwieldy and more decorative than functional, but it's an ugly decoration. I want to throw it out. I'm not saying I'm a good person, but I keep it. I put it on a shelf in my parents' house that's lined with stuffed animals I've been given over the years and no longer play with. I see it each time I go home and get less and less eager to be rid of it. 
there is a gift inside a closet. It's been there for a while now. It's wrapped not neatly in silver wrapping paper with colorful spots. The gift is for a boy turning 17. He still hasn't gotten it. For months at a time, I forget the gift is even there. I find it when I reorganize. I find it when I clean. There are times I take it out. I run my hand over the swatted wrapping paper and contemplate opening it, or maybe throwing it out. I'll turn the gift over in my hand and observe all the things I do every time. The Sharpie words listing to and from on the bottom left corner are still as clear as the day I wrote it, but the edges of the paper have bent. They're no longer crisp and pointed. It's probably from years of being in the closet shoved behind the plastic dresser. The boy and I haven't talked to one another for years. He turns 21 this year. I let myself miss him in the few minutes that I hold on to the gift that I kept forgetting to give him. When I finish, I'll put the gift back in the closet. I don't know how long it'll be there. There is a voicemail on my phone. It's dated November 17th, 2016 at 8.26 p.m. I don't remember the context. I only discovered it a few months ago while looking through my voicemail inbox, which I normally assume is only filled with scam callers looking to sell me mortgage insurance for a house I don't have. It's at the bottom of the list. I haven't spoken to her in years. We had a fight about something that I can't remember anymore. The voicemail starts with a distant beeping and then her voice comes through loud and clear. She introduces herself, makes a series of incoherent noises, tells me I act like a mom, laughs, and then says goodbye. It's 17 seconds long. When I first discovered it, I listened to it five times over. It makes me smile. I delete the other messages, one from the dentist telling me to get a checkup, and a few from scam callers and other unnotable ones. I keep her message. I save a copy of it on my computer. I suppose it's for the same reason I still keep the gift in my closet and the pillow on my shelf. They let me remember the friends who aren't friends anymore. We all keep insignificant things. We forget. We find more insignificant things and add them on. We're all made up of people we don't talk to. We take pieces of those we love and have loved and become who we are. It's the kleptomania of memory. Well, hello, Jasmine, for your story. I, I totally agree with you. Like when we have different friends coming into our lives and we want them to stay in our lives forever but there is a time and place for everybody and yeah. different seasons as well yeah exactly we move on but we still love them yeah a gift received and years later still holding on to it a lost voicemail then found listened to and now holding on to it through our communication we become part of one another we hold on to one another and forgotten in the closet a gift ungiven maybe it's time Whew. can you believe it Ava this is our final story no it happened so fast yeah, how are you feeling right now with all these stories I want to hear more yeah. will you introduce our next storyteller of course of course so our final story is entitled hitting the send button by Jeff Baumgartner Jeff Baumgartner started working at the age of nine as a paper boy. During the, his teen years, he served ice cream, made pizza, and worked at the local movie theater. Before college, he even worked for several years at a mental health hospital. Since then, he's done many things in life, including teaching, research, and medicine. He is a proud co-founder, along with his wife, of a nonprofit pay-what-you-can farm-to-fork restaurant in Colorado. If you grocery shop in Hilo, you may recognize him from Safeway. He enjoys hiking and exploring the island. Oddly, he doesn't like flying, unless he's the one doing the flying. One flight stands out in his memory. Imagine with me. It's about 12 years ago. I'm sitting behind my big clunky computer, composing a very long email. An email I'm going to send to a woman I've known most of my life. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what to say. And somehow I managed to lose that long message I had agonized over. Maybe it just wasn't meant to be. Maybe we were never meant to be. You see, I was her paper boy when we were both 13. I met her the day she moved into the neighborhood. There she was, 
sitting on her new front porch, and she smiled at me. I helped her dad take something out of the truck and got to meet her. We became friends. On the day before she turned 15, I went to her house and told her I had a birthday surprise for her. We rode our bikes across our little Illinois town to a small airport. My years of delivering newspapers was funding my flying lessons. I was a few weeks shy of being 15 myself, and I was going to take her on her first airplane ride for her birthday. I was behind the controls of a four-seater, and there was an instructor with us. That day, I had to practice stalling the plane and regaining control. She was right there for it as we fell and leveled out, fell and leveled out. When we got back to the ground, my instructor said, you did great, you didn't even throw up. Ours was a match made in the heavens. But we were 15 and awkward and friends. We kissed once, but we never came to be. When one of us was single, the other wasn't. Bad timing, always. Now she lived in Colorado and I lived in Illinois. But there I sat behind my big clunky computer years later, knowing we were both single. I decided to write a new email, something very short, not so personal. You know, hope your family is well, would love to hear from you, etc., etc. I hit send. 17 minutes later, she replied. It was friendly, like old friends talking. But what was my counter move here? I had to give this a try, so I took a chance. I responded to a few questions, and then I wrote this. I still have the email. At 48 years young, let me be bold. I would love to have coffee with you and catch up. If I can still make you laugh, that would be good medicine for me. I will be holed over at the Denver airport on my way to Hawaii on July 9th for a couple hours. If that fits into your schedule, maybe we could bump into each other. I don't want to appear overly bold, but I remember how I always felt when you went from being available to being unavailable. How many chances can I hope for? It really wasn't typical for me to do something like this. Three hours and 38 minutes later, she responded saying she would love to meet me at the airport. We met, ate salads, talked. I even missed my plane, but it was worth it. I did make it to Hawaii and was working at Tripler Army Medical Center on Oahu. After weeks of phone conversations at unreasonable hours due to the time difference, I asked her to come visit. We had our first date in Hawaii. Together, we have done some amazing things, including starting a nonprofit organization, working side by side, day after day. We moved to Hawaii Island three and a half years ago, and we will celebrate our 11th wedding anniversary this year. I'm glad I hit the send button. Wow, what a sweet way to end our show. Mm. What do you think, Kiapo? I really do believe that if you're taking risks with anything, it's, it should be with love. Definitely. Truly, yeah. yes, love is always worth it. A 13-year-old paper boy throwing papers onto the porch, and a girl's smile, but right then, not to be, but never to be forgotten. More than 20 years later, 
a reaching out, a hitting the send button, a reaching back. And that's what communication is largely about. Reaching out, reaching back, lives transformed. Beautiful love story, Jeffrey. Thank you so much. All of our wonderful storytellers telling stories of coming together in unity and in love, connection, communication, directly to the heart, one to the other. Beautiful collection, beautiful theme, the importance of reaching out and reaching back and closing the circle. Thank you, storytellers. We want to get a special thank you to everyone who was a part of our show today. Thank you, Ron Gordon, Lee Dombrowski, Randy Hirakawa, Rebecca Choi, Jasmine Zhao, and Jeff Baumgartner. A special shout out goes to UH Hilo's Performing Arts Center, Mookini Library, and the English Club for their support in making this show possible. Do you have a great story? Tell the world at Vai Lao. Our next Vai Lao theme is A Just World. <gasps> wow. <laughs> if you would like to join us, submit your story by March 5th at hilo.hawaii.edu slash And selected stories will be aired April 24th. Well, that's that. Happy Valentine's Day. And ahuyo.